You probably didn't know this about me, but when I was younger, I would demolish as an absolutely destroy Sudoku books. No matter how many Sudoku puzzles I got, I would just keep solving them because I guess I was too smart or something. But it's kind of like a heroin addict who just needs his next fix. You're gonna run out of Sudoku puzzles eventually, and I thought there, there must be some way to generate these things procedurally, and that's what we're doing today. We're making procedural Sudoku in Blender, and by the way, that whole story about me ripping through Sudoku when I was younger, it's complete bullshit, but sometimes you gotta make a story to get people invested. Anyways, here it is. This is the node group that makes procedural Sudoku, and I know what you're thinking. Damn, <laughs> there's quite a few nodes going on over here, and if you are thinking that way, which is already a problem, just fucking quit it, because all the other soldiers are gonna make fun of you. This really isn't too big of a deal, especially when we take these node groups and you know break them up it's just a couple math nodes don't cry about it it's not a big deal point is all this stuff that i'm gonna explain what it means um it just boils down to a couple sliders so first of all we can generate sudoku puzzles on the fly using a single number isn't that pretty cool no wonder those sudoku book companies are making so much money they probably have a similar setup where they just change a single number and then basically print out the money from all the idiots and like booksmith buying it the reason this works by the way that it makes a uh, workable sudoku puzzles is because of all this math here we're going to talk about it other stuff is we can control how many of those tiles are going to be empty. So yeah, um, a hard puzzle is one that goes all the way down to only a few of these. So this is basically just giving you an empty slate and saying, no, figure it out. <laughs> uh, whereas as we go higher, it becomes an easier and easier puzzle. We can also say which of those tiles we want to be empty. So to generate an, you know, a different version of the same puzzle. And then finally, of course, I also did the grid procedurally because it wouldn't be November. It wouldn't be procedural nodes uh, without all that nonsense. Anyways, I guess we should talk about a bit of theory about why this works uh, so that it makes sense, right? Did I create some kind of advanced algorithm, some kind of neural network built into the fucking node editor? Well, no. Clearly, there must be some kind of simple stuff going on because it was only like 30 nodes. So, here's how I made it. If you take a Sudoku puzzle that is already solved, the key insight is if you take any of these columns, you can swap out the rows and everything still makes sense. So, you've generated a new Sudoku puzzle with that transformation that preserves its solvability, if that makes any sense. And this applies to any column and also any row. So, in other words, generating a new Sudoku puzzle is just a matter of transforming forming a pre-existing one that works. So we're kind of stealing, but making it our own. Transformations are going to be the name of the game. How do we do them? Before we do anything, a prerequisite or a precursor, I guess, is you want to add in a plane. This is what we're going to project our Sudoku onto and then go to the shading workspace. And before we do any texture coordinate transformations, of course, we need to generate six random numbers for the columns, the rows, stuff like that. Create a new material. And what we're going to do right off the bat is we're going to add an a value node. You can think of this as a seed and you're going to connect this to a white noise. I know this is a mysterious note. Don't worry about it. All you have to do is connect this to this, and it's going to output a color output, which you can think of as effectively six random numbers. So you have your X, Y, and Z coordinates that all change depending on what your seed is. And then, since we already have three random numbers to get another set of three random numbers, we just take these, we duplicate them down, and so that we don't use the same seed, I guess we use a math node set to addition, subtraction to absolutely whatever you want it to be. Connect this, connect this, and now we have six random numbers. And something to consider is all these random numbers should in fact be a multiple of a ninth since that's what we want to translate this by like a ninth of a tile going across add in a vector math node boom add that in right there set this to snap in other words like rounding if i could even find snap they try to hide this away and make that to the closest ninth for again the x y and z component which we can do for both sets of random numbers and just like that we've generated a random number generator again it's made up of these nodes that i showed you how to make but now it's packaged nicely so we have our six random numbers that are a multiple of a ninth with a seed that controls all of them and uh yeah just to clarify, we made those random numbers not because we have like a random number generator fetish or something like that, but in fact, we need it for the transformation that we're doing for the X and Y axis, which happened to be the same transformation. So let's make that transformation. Well, the first step, of course, is going to be importing in texture coordinates because we can't manipulate coordinates if we don't have any, you know, duh. Uh, we're going to be using UV coordinates because they look nice and they stand for cool stuff like ultraviolet or maybe ultraviolet if you watch that Clockwork Orange movie. Either way, take whatever coordinate system you're using, preferably preferably UV or generated. We have X, Y, and Z, and now the name of the game is how do we manipulate right here so that we get the Sudoku transformation per axis. First thing we need to do is separate the left, middle, and right columns so we can control them all independently. And to create those masks, it's actually pretty simple. We're gonna use some math nodes. First one's gonna be less than one divided by three. For the right column, it's basically the same thing. You take less than, turn it to greater than, change this to two thirds. So we are saying 
where is this plane greater than two thirds on the X axis? And then finally for the middle column, which you know, this one's a bit tricky. You can't do it with one node. We're using less than or greater than. What we're gonna need to do is use that secret 2.82 addition of the compare node. We're gonna compare X to halfway in between. So that's 0.5 with a radius, a thickness, a magnitude of one third divided by two, which is gonna be one over six. We have a left, middle and right column that we can now control independently. I just wanna jump in here. I know nodes are super boring. I'm aware of this, but there really is no other way to explain this stuff. I wish there was a more visually, I don't know, grabbing, interesting way, something that you could really sink your teeth into and pull those things out. Your gums are gonna be bleeding out all over the floor, but sadly there, there's no such thing. So nodes are just gonna be the way it has to be. It's kind of like an initiation process. We all go through back to the nodes. And of course, what we wanna do is assign three of these random numbers, one to each of the left, middle, and right. And to do this, what we do is we take this, we set it to multiply. So we're saying only look at this area on the left, multiplied by the first random number, and then we're just gonna kind of repeat this. And now we have a random number assigned to each of these columns, which of course will change depending on whatever our seed is. These are all gonna be multiples of a ninth. Next, what we need to do is do an addition so that we're adding whatever random number we're using on the left column, we add the X axis. So again, it's going from left to right. We take this, we modulo it by a third. So again, it's kind of rolling back. If it's going past its own column, it's rounding back down. That's the point of the modulo. Finally, we are going to multiply it again. So we isolate it using the mask from before so that now we have a texture coordinate transformation, at least on the first column that is completely dependent on whatever this seed is going to be. For the other two columns, we're pretty much doing the same thing. So why not just duplicate some notes so that we don't have to add them ourselves? That sounds like a lot of work. Duplicate these and then just pretty much set it up the same way as it was last time. Again, same setup as up above. And then finally for the multiplication by the mask, make sure it's using the respective mask from before. So that now we have this kind of random setup for each of these columns. But one kind of correction term we need to do is for the second and third column, we need to shift over by either a third or two thirds because we're moduloing by third. So to do this, what we do is before we multiply, we are going to add by third. And then for this one, we are going to add by two thirds so that now we have a kind of shifted along the X axis corrected setup here. And look at all those math nodes. This is getting confusing. Let's wrap it up here. Last thing we need to do is take these three columns and incorporate them together. To do that, we're just going to take our multiply and set this to add. So we're adding these two together. And then finally, we are going to add the third column so that now we have a transformed coordinate system. Look at that. That's looking awesome. And once you clean this up into a nice little node group, you can see again, the idea here is we're using three random numbers. We're going to have three left over for the Y axis. And then we're saying manipulate the X axis. So long story short, we just take this node group and without doing any changes, that's kind of the key idea here. We take the Y axis and now we are shuffling the Y axis, plug in a random number and two and three. There you go. Finally, we take these and incorporate them together with a combine X, Y, Z, boop, boop. And finally, we have a setup that with a single number, single generator gives us transform Sudoku coordinates. That's when we take a base solution. So here's an example. When you take this and use this as the texture coordinate system, you can see that now we get randomly generated Sudoku that if you check, you know, take the time to solve this shit. These are solvable Sudoku puzzles is the point. And by the way, if you want to make your grid procedurally as well, because why not make everything procedural? Use the same texture coordinates as before. So again, these ultraviolet coordinates, some hilarious. Take those. What we're going to do is we're going to be using vector mass. So connect that right there. Set this one to scale and we're going to scale this by nine because again, Sudokus are nine by nine. At least last I checked, that was the case. Take this, add another vector math, connect that like this. Right now, this is what we're seeing and then make sure that this is set to fraction. Why can I never find it? Where's fraction? Here we go. Take this, separate by X, Y, Z so we can look at each of these independently and then just like before with the column separation, we're going to use a compare. Take these two, multiply these ideas together and that gives you a grid once we actually pick a good value. Whoops, not that. Make sure you, you're using a value node. Connect this here connect this here and then something slightly lower than 0.5 gives you a nine by nine grid. There you go. So you now know how to make procedural Sudoku. I guess go make a book of them or something and try to sell it yourself. Anyways, that's it. Thanks for making it to the end of the tutorial and thank you Skillshare for sponsoring this video. What is Skillshare? Skillshare is a online learning community with thousands of classes going over stuff like photography, videography, and also Blender. On top of having all these courses, they also have online workshops so you could work alongside at least virtually thousands of other people at the same time, which is a good thing for motivation. And one course in particular I wanna recommend is Filmmaking From Home by Penny Lane, which is this course about the idea of making a film never using your own footage, just using stock footage, stuff that other people recorded. So 
how do you weave a story together when the footage isn't even yours in the first place? So it is something interesting to do, especially if you don't care for filming your own stuff. You can watch this course and all other courses on the Skillshare platform ad-free when you have the premium membership. And if you do not have the premium membership, which by the way is under $10 a month, then I'm gonna pitch you a deal that maybe you are interested in. For a limited time, if you click my link in the description, you can try a free trial of the premium membership of Skillshare just by clicking that link. So if this is something you're interested in, that's something you'd want to do.